Let's talk to uh, L in Arizona. L, what can we do for you tonight? Oh, good a- good afternoon, guys. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Hey, not too bad. What's no. on your mind? Hi. Um, I just wanted to add in regards to the uh, definition of turf. I think a better acronym for that would be something I refer as an anti, which is a- uh, anti non-binary trans individual. So I usually call these individuals antis. So that's my acronym I generally use in regards to it. So. Um, in reference to the letter, I actually read uh, Katie's uh, entire periodical on the discussion of J.K. Rowling, and I found it to be incredibly uh, informative. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize is uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I go by Iliani online on Twitter. I, v, you probably remember following me. But yeah. um, in reference to this, um, you guys have to understand that I used to be an alt, uh, a, a borderline race realist. I used to be almost alt light, And this is a bigger dilemma larger than I I don't think a lot of people understand. And what I'm talking about is if you, if I take my intrinsic experiences I had in my past and correlate it to what I'm currently seeing and kind of, kind of going through and what I'm looking at in regards to specific narratives, this is a common talking point about basically LGBT individuals like Katie mentioned that dates back to the 1970s. Um, See, for me, this is a common talking point you saw become predicated in 2017 with a person named Jordan Peterson, someone I'm pretty sure you guys are pretty well familiar with. Unfortunately, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jordan Peterson became famous because of um, C-16 in Canada. Mm -hmm. And this is when this entire discussion, this disagreement about trans individuals and restrooms became more pervasive. And I would argue that most of this became more enlarged after uh, gay marriage became legal here in the United States. And it just became a more broader, large emphasis in places like the UK, places in Europe, so on and so forth. But bottom line is this, I I know this is is gonna be a large claim, but this is a mainstay of what I perpetuate in regards to my own talking points in my own channel, is this is a narrative that is encompassing to something that Jordan Peterson espoused for many, many years now, so it's called cultural Marxism. If you really look at an emphasis of this talking point, this has direct correlation to an emphasis of cultural Marxism that dates back to the 1960s about supposed degeneracy within society. And one of the main purveyors of this talking point was directly tied with a well-known anti-trans group known as the LGB Alliance called the Heritage Foundation. Do you guys know who that is? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the Heritage Foundation is a uh, highly conservative tank think, uh, think tank here in the United States. But suffice it to say, there was an individual that co-founded that organization by the name of Paul Rayrich. Paul Rayrich was one of the most well-known pervasive common talking points of cultural Marxism. But to sum it all up, what I'm saying is, this is a specific narrative and worldview that has been around a very long time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of individuals need to understand that this narrative, this worldview, is why we're facing such oppression in regards to trans individuals like myself and others. And if I can just cap off at this, and I'm sorry if I talk so much, but for me, the biggest issue I'm seeing from my trans medicalists, people like J.K. Rowling, not only from the in situations in the U.K., but also from trans veterans. These are the same talking points and the problems trans veterans here in the U.S. have faced for decades. And this is coming from many, many individuals I've spoken to in person here in Arizona where I live, that this is what they've heard for decades. But I'm sorry, I've, I've rambled on too long. No, that's a beautiful way to to kind of summarize a lot of what we've been talking about and give it that that historical kind of context there. So I appreciate that, Elle. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to mention this because a lot of people don't understand that the narrative of cultural Marxism is if you go back and you look at literature back in the 1960s and 70s, I've actually linked it in uh, on my Twitter page on, on periodicals I've saved on, on a big file I have on my research. But 
There are articles, there are periodicals from homophobes back in the day, from the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s, people that were directly aligned with people like Paul Rayrich, that used the very similar talking points you currently right. see with the antis or the quote-unquote gender-critical individuals. One of the things that I, I find incredibly disgusting to me, that's the only way I can describe it, is how they claim to be supposedly for science, yet they'll promote individual um, ideas such as ROGD, an unscientific recognized men, uh, mental, uh, mental condition, anywhere by any major organization anywhere in the world. Yeah. They'll promote uh, an idea that biological sex is immutable to gender, which that is not the case. That's actually anti-science. And these are the main talking points of the gender critical movement, yet I don't see a lot of people except individuals like Katie clearly indicate this, which is a good thing, but I wish more individuals would notate these specific narratives by these individuals to clearly demonstrate that they are anti-science by every measure. But that's yeah. my only my opinion. That's, that's something that I, like as someone who considers themselves like quite skeptical and like interested in science and stuff, I find very frustrating mm -hmm. that, um, at least in the UK, the gender critical movement has managed to culturally put put itself as like the pro science position, and people like mm -hmm. kind of buy into that. They're like, okay, yeah, I'll be nice to trans people and I'll I'll let them do what they want, but I support science. Mm -hmm. And they they kind of create this um, false dichotomy of like, do you support like, yeah, for, you can support trans rights, but we we can't start denying science. And I'm like. Right. <laughs> this, first of all, you're creating a false dichotomy because you can actually do both of those things. But secondly, m one of the biggest issues with the gender critical position is it's like anti-science, like in several ways, like to its core. Um, and yeah, they've, they've definitely managed to put themselves towards like that. And it's interesting you, can, you said about race realism. I think that there's definitely some parallel to that. No. Um, no, Katie, you have no idea how much parallel there is with it when it comes to the previous rhetoric I once believed prior to 2016. Yeah. I was a major content creator on YouTube until I retired finding out that I was intersex and I had gender dysphoria in 2018. So a lot of correlation in regards to talking points like Stephen Molyneux and many others. I can direct, there, of course there are different topics or different notions. Of course, race is not the same as gender, but the same pandering, the same, you know, this is the real science was a common talking point yeah. I myself used during that three-year period. So yeah. when I hear individuals within the gender critical movement make similar connotations, this is precisely the methods and the tactics I once used when I was a reactionary at that time. So 100%. I, I mean, this is the, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is this right? It's, it's like this, um, like, oh, we want to be nice, but this is like, the science, this is the truth, and we can't just hold the truth back because we're, we're being nice to people. And like, this is kind of, a, it's the science that's, the science itself is revealing that racism is true or whatever, and like, there's nothing we can do about it. And it's this kind of like, I want to have my opinion, but I also, which is bullshit, but I want to not be called out for having a bullshit opinion. So instead I say, this is not my opinion, it's what the science says. So then you just come up with some pseudoscience nonsense to back it up. Um, and and then that makes you look like you're oh you know it's not my fault I'm not transphobic I just am presenting this scientific paper which says trans oh people are God. terrible. Um, yes, I I literally <laughs> I posted the link to this this uh, stream on Twitter and I was like hey this is what we're going to be talking about and somebody commented on Twitter I'm just too much of a skeptic to buy into all of this and I'm like I. I was like, okay, you don't have to, but don't claim it's skepticism. It's a bad narrative that you bought into. Don't pretend it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like, be be skeptical. Like, come and like hit me up on Twitter if you're a skeptical of trans people. Like, if you're actually skeptical, then maybe you won't reach the same position I have because you you know because you're wrong. No, because um, I'm not there yet or whatever. But I don't think it's possible to get to the mainstream gender critical position from skepticism. I think mm -hmm. that have to yeah, could I, could I, could And it's, and it's been evidence. That was mentioned earlier. Yeah, go for it. Would you, would you go 
Um, you guys mentioned something about cancel culture. Now, this is another thing I've been doing a lot of research on. I'm going to be very blunt here, as I typically am. Cancel culture is a bullshit narrative, pardon my language. Every form of fashion in regards to what cancel culture generally is, is McCarthyism. Anyone who espouses the definition or the terminology of cancel culture is literally speaking against something known as rights of association here in the United States. If you research what rights of association, which is a constitutional right equal to free speech, anyone who espouses cancel culture as a form of talking point, literally speaking against free speech and the U.S. Constitution. And to prove this point, I don't know if you know this, Katie and uh, V and, uh, and Christy, but just today it was announced that J.K. Rowling, the very individual who signed that supposed letter a month ago, just threatened to sue a periodical for publishing a an opinion piece of supposedly claiming that she's a transphobe. So Miss J.K. Rowling, who believes in free speech, believes in discourse, threatened a libel suit against a publication for an opinion piece. This is yeah. how much these individuals generally believe in free speech. This is hypocrisy in display here. This is why cancel culture is not a real thing. The, um, the level that uh, gender critical goes to saying they're the ones pushing for free speech and then shutting down trans people's free speech is uh, like, that's the tip of the iceberg. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but like, I know lots of people who have um, lost their jobs, particularly journalists and um, particularly in the UK um, for not directly for being trans, but for not wanting to go along with the like gender critical position. Um, and they're very happy to just totally shut them down, you know, with legal threats and, um, like I myself has all, have also uh, received a legal threat um, for discussing trans issues from someone who's been pushing, oh, we just want free speech, we just want a discussion. Right. Um, I think it's it's such a it's it's almost like part of it. Like I, you know, I don't I don't think it can be. Lots of people. I think it's just rich people. You know, rich people often sue people and they want free speech at the same time. But it's you know they they've got more rich people. <laughs> So it happens more. It just—it's very like it's just so, yeah, tediously hypocritical. It's like, well, well, oh. the medium, that medium, uh, the periodical that you wrote that paper with, Katie, did a great uh, piece about two or three years ago, speaking on why cancel culture is not a true narrative. And I, I just want to cap it with this. If you really believe, if you really want to know what cancel culture genuinely is, except which is there's a differentiation called call out culture, where there are two distinct right. things. They have some correlation with one another, but not, they're not the same. McCarthyism, if you look at the people that experienced McCarthyism from the 19, uh, late 40s yeah, okay. all the way to the 1960s, right, those right. people were completely. What's that? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, that's a, that is a, a whole conversation that honestly, I'd love to get into at some point. Elle, um, we're going to pop you back to our call screener. I'm fascinated by your story and would love to talk about maybe getting you on the show at some point as a guest. Um, so if you would uh, like to pop back onto hold, we'll get our call screener to get maybe some information if that's something you'd be interested in doing. Sure, V. Not a problem. Awesome. Katie, All right. Thank you keep so up the great work. I, I just wanted to mention, Katie, keep up the great work and congratulations on your relationship again, V. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All Take right. Care. Thanks so much for calling in, Al. Yeah. You know, I, I want to mention just briefly, it doesn't feel like it needs to be said, but it also really needs to be said. There's plenty of science on this side of the aisle. There's all of the science on this side mm -hmm. of the aisle. Uh, and, and we've got some links and things to that in the show notes. If you're curious, if you're skeptical, I mean, this is the ACA. We invite skepticism. I mm. promise you, if you're right now feeling a little bit frustrated or concerned, do your research well and you will find that information. Uh, I've got links to uh, different neuroscience journals, different psychiatric journals, all kinds of things worth checking out. Yeah. Um, can I just add one thing on this, like, skeptic? skepticism. Thing. Yes, please. Think, sure. it's, really um, it's posed like two sides. It's posed like the gender critical side and like they'll often say trans rights activists, but often, in often case, um, a trans rights activist is a trans person who wants human rights. 
And so very quickly, it becomes like most trans people. And mm -hmm. if you're if you're skeptical of a position, um, then you want to be taking on like the political position or the belief system or something, not like a person. Um, I think that really, I mean, maybe this will sound one sided and you can dismiss it, but I feel like gender critical is a political position and really anyone who believes it should be able to argue it. I mean, really, mm -hmm. you know, if you take a political position, then people should be able to be skeptical of it. But being trans itself isn't a political position. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, if you know, if, if they if they you know post a picture and you're like, debate trans rights with me, like you know, they might just be like, fuck off. I just want to go to the toilet. Like I this I don't feel this is a political position. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can spin anything as a political position, but you know, someone like me who is arguing the political side of trans rights i'll argue it with you but don't like assume that every or even most or even any trans people should have to defend being trans as a thing um, right exactly so and there's this now, weird like approach to it where if you get upset you're suddenly no longer skeptical or no longer rational mm -hmm. so there's this this sense that not only am i going to ask you to debate your existence with me a stranger but if you get upset about the the, the intrusive and offensive questions that i'm going to ask under the guise of being a skeptic suddenly you forfeit your right to claim skepticism yourself or to claim yeah. rationality and you're just being hysterical and and clearly this is an emotional argument for you and there's no stock in it so it's it's a lose-lose situation if you if you don't engage you're running away from it if you engage too much then suddenly you're no longer being rational and it's mm -hmm. just this this infuriating uh it, it, it's a demand for performance that honestly yeah. i i don't know about you katie i'm, I'm sick of performing <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of addicted to it, but yeah, I'm also sick of it. <laughs> I think that, um, like, you know, lots of skeptical people aren't like being malicious about it or whatever. They literally just like, oh, a trans person has said something. I've, I've got this view. I want to test it out. I want to ask some questions, like defend your position. Mm -hmm. um, just if you want to do that, that's that's legit. But just find someone who is taking a political position rather than someone who is just trans. You know that there's a there's a distinction right that, that's, exactly. that's why i'd say and that's why it often looks like the trans side doesn't want to debate because the trans side is actually mainly just trans people um it's a like, really I, good distinction yeah yeah whereas gender critical people are all opt into it you're not born gender critical anyway right. yeah right Next. Well, I, I think it's a good reminder to all of us to, you know, change the hearts and minds that you care to, uh, but the, your existence doesn't obligate you to debate. You know, it, Katie did a really beautiful job of separating out sort of like a political position versus simply existing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that often, like, this is a kind of minority group thing in general, um, being a minority group kind of is political because people often don't separate them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you kind of find yourself having to justify why you should be the same as everyone else. Yeah. Like, right. And then you're that. suddenly a spokesperson for the whole group. <laughs> as yeah. Person. And then you say, fuck off. I don't want to debate. And it's like, they go, trans people hate debating. Yep. They're all wrong. It's, <laughs> it's religion. I don't believe in it. It's nonsense. Oh, goodness. Well, <laughs> How I don't know that this works for everybody, but I don't know about the two of you. I just put all of these positions on a website, put that website on a business card, and if somebody wants to debate me at a party, they can pay my consultation fees. They, you know, like, here, go for it. Like, I will absolutely argue with you, but if you're good at something, don't do it for free. There you go. I like it.